Cool. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit more details on what we're doing on the vehicle side of, uh, of Elevate. Um, but actually, I, I, I want to start with uh, making sure I follow on to what Mike said, and that is we, we are committed to helping build a foundation for eVTOL. And that's not about one winner. It's about having many winners, a feasible market, and a productive ecosystem. So we very much want to not pick a winner, um, but have many, several successful vehicles that are able to be part of this marketplace. And so again, uh, HS is helping to build a foundation. We want to support building that foundation for, uh, for uh, uh, eVTOL and, and the urban air mobility. So you can see uh, throughout the next day, please stay around for Friday. There's really some great content and we have many of our different leads who will be uh, contributing to the discussions, the panels, um, and, and different um, singular talks. So please uh, stick around. So uh, a question I get is uh, uh, quite a bit is, you know, why did I leave NASA and, and join Uber? And, and I am very much a vehicle guy. I've dedicated my entire life uh, career towards uh, studying and, and developing VTOL aircraft and their technologies. And I think it's really important to recognize up front that we have an incredible opportunity to do things right from the beginning with this new transportation system. And uh, again, I'm very much a vehicle guy, but I hate to say this, this is not all about the vehicle. It is about developing a, a new system and, you know, so in, instead of having vehicles that show up in an ad hoc way where someone says, I've got a great idea and I'm just going to do it, um, it doesn't go so well. And you can look back at the VLJ, the very light jet market, um, you know, from the 2000s and how they tried to uh, essentially just develop vehicles and then put them into a network context and quickly they found out that there was a fundamental mismatch between the vehicles they developed and the network that they were trying to operate. Um, so we also don't, you know, have to force these vehicles into an existing infrastructure, right? We're, we're not only developing new vehicles, we're developing new infrastructure and new networks. So this very much kind of goes back to, uh, you know, the late 1800s when, guess what, one of the railroad companies had a better idea for a wider track, uh, you know, car. Well, it was already too late at that point, right? The tracks were laid down. There was a four foot eight inch standard and somebody coming up with a better, a safer, uh, you know, railroad car that was six feet wide. Sorry, it was too late because you had to fit into the existing infrastructure. And we don't have to do that. So instead what we need to do is build, design all of it together to make sense. Understand the requirements across all these different parts of the system, understand the interfaces, and not just have this attitude, which is what's happened many times in the past in aerospace of, you know, if we build it, the market will come. Well, uh, we've got, we're gonna turn that around on its head and we're gonna say, hey, we're the market, we're representing the users, we've come, and you know we've got 65 million users already who we could provide access to. It's going to be many more than that once uh, you know you have the aircraft ready. Let's develop the entire network to make sense together to provide the optimal user experience, the optimal costs, um, the, the most efficient networks, and, and do it right from the beginning. So that that really means. As cool as these vehicles are that the 50 companies are doing, it's not just about the vehicles. It's understanding the entire transportation system that we're developing and to be part of that, yeah, that was uh, gonna convince me that it was time to leave NASA and, and be part of this, uh, this whole new aviation industry. So what we're doing uh, at Uber Elevate really, in my mind, breaks down into two different areas. And, and, and one that I'm representing is closing the vehicle capability gaps. And that includes developing requirements, standards, doing user surveys to understand their perspectives, uh, developing analysis tools, and uh, fertilizing the ecosystem so that all the technology gaps can be closed uh, in, 
along a developmental timeline that makes sense and, and embraces the community and brings them all together. But that's just the vehicle side of things, right? I mean, the other thing that Uber's committed to is developing a highly efficient airspace operations network that can provide the seamless multimodal connectivity of a, a, of a really great transportation experience to a huge user base. And that, to me, those are the two core things that are really gonna enable this urban air mobility. Again, it's not all about us. It's about all of us making this a feasible market together. So Mike showed this wheel. Thanks for developing this uh, wheel uh, 10 years ago. You need to develop a new wheel, right? You're on the hook to develop a new EV tow wheel um, that we can all share and, and, and uh, uh, we're not calling it the wheel of misfortune this time though. Don't even, don't even try it. Um, so what we're trying to do is realize, wow, there's a, a lot of different directions these vehicles can go. Uh, fundamentally changes the capabilities and major parts of this network. Um, so how do we navigate this wheel? How do we guide to the best possible system solutions? Um, so one of the places we started this past year was developing a, a great requirements document, right? If, if you want a great vehicle, you better start with a great requirement set. Um, so this is an a, a extensive document with many, many uh, presentations that substantiate the requirements that we've specified. Most of this is really just design uh, a guidance um, for the vehicle developers. So I, I actually even hesitate calling it a requirements document because it's much more a guidance document with lots and lots of substantiation um, of the market basis because we really understand well where people are traveling, you know, and, and the, the times required, which then relates to speed range payload, but much, much more than that. So there's really only a few places where we get very prescriptive and say, thou shalt follow this requirement. Um, and those are areas where we really want to make sure this industry gets ahead, especially in terms of safety, so that we don't end up uh, at, at a later time where the FAA needs to come in and, and start being prescriptive for our industry. So an example of that is, uh, for instance, it's not a requirement in Part 135 to separate the pilot from the passengers. We actually think it's a really good idea to have at least a minimal separation between the pilot and the passengers for safety reasons. So that is one of the examples where we're being prescriptive and saying, hey, thou shalt have at least a minimal separation so that we ensure that those passengers can't quickly overcome the pilot. Um, so uh, just one quick example. We're developing addition requirement documents um, uh, across battery, conops, airspace, and, and autonomy. All of these are really important things to understand and not just develop ad hoc um, uh, across different, uh, different entity desires. So I want to focus a little bit about, uh, on, on the reference, common reference, con uh, uh, common reference model is what uh, we call it, uh, and, and, and why we've developed this. Um, and just, you know, quickly, you've seen this video, it, it's a unique concept. Um, all of our partners are developing fantastic vehicles. Many of them have not shown them yet. And, and so we, you know, one quick reason is we just wanted a concept that we could share to start acclimating the public, um, the uh, academia, NASA, everyone to what these vehicles are going to tend to look like and the properties and characteristics. But there's many, many other reasons why we're coming up with these common reference models that I want to share with you because I think if we do this all together, we're going to lay a really, really good foundation. And it's not just about us coming up with common reference models. First of all, there's tool gaps. You know, and, and there's been some excellent presentations this week on, on, on different tools. Um, we're certainly going to make use of NDARC, Overflow, uh, OpenVSP, great tool sets that have been developed that are public. Uh, but there's fundamental gaps uh, as well, especially relating to the most important requirement, which is the acoustics, right? And we are going to bludgeon the industry about the community noise because that is the door that's opening the market. 
we will continue to harp and harp and harp and nag that these vehicles must be way quieter than helicopters. And that's why tomorrow you're going to hear from David Josephson where we're developing um, new acoustic standards. Where you're going to hear from Rob how we're pushing for um, uh, the wonderful design, uh, acoustic analysis, uh, aeroacoustic analyses to be able to be brought up way forward and working with uh, experts such as uh, uh, Ken Brentner who, you know, with WAP WAP. I mean, just imagine if you could have WAP WAP right up in the front of your analysis, really giving you guidance on, uh, on uh, you know, how you can develop the quietest uh, EV tow. Um, so we, we really are committed to making sure we can help close the analysis gaps, whether that's for transition control, acoustics, energetics, etc. So that's a, a key reason because if you can't just develop a tool and throw, hand it off, right? I mean, you really need to have baseline cases where people can understand a, a good analysis case um, and, and have that reference baseline analysis as they spin off and, and create their own models. Um, but we, we, uh, another objective we have is to improve the, uh, or to showcase the impact of, of new technologies. And, you know, if we can have a common baseline model, then that lets us put on and take off different technologies and understand very, very clearly what the impact of that technology is. And, again, we don't want to just be doing that ourselves. We want NASA to be able to do that and academia to do that and for us to all speak a common language of baselines and technologies so that we can all establish credibility and, and move the, the most important technologies forward. Um, also, you know, for our Elevate partners, we wanted to make sure that, uh, again, we can hit on the three most in, important gaps that, where we think we can help them, we can accelerate them you know, relating to energetics, transition, uh, control, and, and the complex environment that these vehicles are operating in cities, um, as well as, again, that community noise uh, des design focus. Um, I, I mentioned already, so it's not just enough for industry to do this, right, with a near-term perspective of just getting the flight demonstrator out. We are building the foundation for an entire new industry over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, we want to do it in a way that can have near-term focuses and long-term focuses. And we think there's a vital role for NASA and academia to have the longer-term perspective so that we can not just be focused on the first generation of distributed electric propulsion, but also on the second and third um, because I know the concepts that I'm seeing now are just going to get better and better as we understand how to design these aircraft with the wonderful new degrees of freedom that exist with these enabling technologies. Um, so you can kind of see, I, you, you get the basic idea. So essentially, this is about uh, establishing these open models that are accessible to everyone and um, letting them contribute uh, to this ecosystem. Again, not just for us to specify common reference models, we want others to, to work with us to establish many different com common reference models. So tomorrow you're going to hear Rob talk much more about this. Uh, again, we're not trying to reinvent uh, the, the, the tool framework, but we know there's gaps for uh, these type of vehicles, these type of operational analyses, and we want to help close the gaps and, and do so in a very collaborative um, way. Um, also, there, there's an opportunity, again, since we're, we're, doing, we're designing this whole system from the start to actually try to design in common user experiences, right? So that we can design cabins where it's kind of like a car, where every car you get in kind of feels the same way. And uh, you know that there's, th the user base expects that. The public expects that we have this kind of uniformity. And um, there's a great chance for us to contribute in that area. Well, you're going to hear from John Badalamente tomorrow as he talks about uh, vertiport and cabin design and designing for that user experience. We're also wanting to push technologies, right? Because w we know there's technologies out there that can make these vehicles better. And it's not just about 
our ideas. In fact, one of the technologies that I'm excited about goes all the way back to the 1960s with Hamilton Standard and um, their variable camber propeller. Sikorsky did very similar tests um, with co-rotating uh, stacked blades and even the mission adaptive rotor, um, I guess, got into this. We have much of the data, not all of the data, which has really gotten us pretty excited about this idea of stacking the propellers. And, and my simple explanation for this will be that you, uh, it's just kind of like a biplane where you induce um, um, non-planar uh, uh, mass flow uh, benefits and you're able to separate uh, tip vortices. But also the co-rotating uh, nature um, actually lets you essentially have a multi-element uh, airfoil instead of, uh, you know, a simple airfoil for a propeller that gets a seal maximum of like 0.9 or 1. Now you can actually design for much higher coefficients of lift which is really important to that hover condition. In fact, Hamilton Standard de developed these variable camber props for stole aircraft because to get lots and lots of thrust out at that static condition. Um, so again, what's unique, you know, why go back to something that was developed in the 1960s? Well, we have new degrees of freedom. Now all of a sudden, we can put two different motors on these uh, stacked propellers and independently control them and do so in a manner that's really uh, incredibly precise where they can have an exact azimuth separation um, which gets you different performance or acoustic uh, benefits. And I'm excited that uh, actually NASA Langley is, is uh, working in this area. We also heard, uh, what, uh, yesterday or the day before, an awesome paper from the Army that had looked at a baseline uh, rotor versus counter-rotating uh, uh, stacked rotors versus co-rotating sta uh, stacked propellers. Uh, I can't wait to read that paper because it, it was showing um, a really good fundamental understanding of the physics of, of the flow that was happening there and how co-rotating is providing um, a performance benefit in terms of the figure of merit um, over counter-rotating or a, a conventional propeller. And in fact, the, the NASA data um, is, is also showing this. This is a little preview. Uh, a little preview. Um, they will be presenting the paper at aviation, uh, AIAA aviation conference in uh, June. But you can see here that, hey, if, if you're just interested in the lightly loaded condition, stacked propellers aren't going to do much. But when you're really pushing these to uh, the design uh, point, um, to the high coefficients of thrust that you're able to achieve uh, on the order of 4 to 6 percent improvement in the figure of merit at this highly loaded condition. It's a really exciting uh, improvement if you're designing VTOL aircraft. But the coolest thing about it is not only is it a performance improvement in the figure of merit, but it's also decreasing the noise. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not an acoustic expert, so I can't really explain this, but you can see one of the uh, uh, frequency spectra from the data. Um, I won't talk about the blade harmonics at the lower frequency because I still don't understand exactly what's going on there, but the stack propeller is uh, mul uh, multiple C, uh, dB quieter, and you can see in that, uh, out in the broadband noise at the higher frequency, that that red curve of the stacked propeller is considerably lower noise than the in-plane baseline case. And, you know, as we all push to lower tip speed solutions, um, you know, you end up with a broadband dominated acoustic source. And if there's things that can get me to a lower broadband noise, I'm really excited to, to take advantage of it. Um, I should have started this movie before. Um, I'm going to showcase quick, uh, with, with permission of LaunchPoint, an experiment that they did for me when I was uh, at, at NASA, which relates very, very importantly to these stack propellers. And that is they developed uh, these two motors um, with a master-slave single controller. And essentially you'll see as you go through these different movies, they initially had it off and they'd introduce a disturbance to show how, you know, it would uh, uh, 
delay and they wouldn't track precisely. But then later on in the video, you'll see that with this master-slave relationship between uh, the propellers, that they're able to precisely match, even at ridiculously high RPM or slow RPM, precisely match the azimuth location um, of, these, uh, of these two blades. Um, uh, so even with, in the presence of extreme disturbances, they're able to uh, maintain synchronization. So this is a key technology for enabling these stacked, digitally synced propellers where you can maximize for uh, performance or for noise, um, even dynamically across the uh, hover to transition flow for these lift plus cruise propellers. So, you know, before, um, when I, I had initially been thinking about this, I would have people say, oh no, but the controllers can't do it. Actually, the controllers can do it, and at this small scale, it's even harder than at the larger scale. So I'm really excited that we're working with companies like La LaunchPoint to stimulate the ecosystem so that all of the vehicle uh, companies can have new technologies at their disposal to make these vehicles even better. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but I'll just uh, talk about one other uh, technology here. That is, many, many of the uh, concepts that you see on this new wheel are pushing towards lift plus cruise, and for a very good reason, and that is to minimize complexity. And as you look at the, the use of this vehicle on our network, you realize that in one year, a vehicle is going to go through 25,000 articulations, right? If it's a tilt rotor, it's doing that 25,000 times across the year because these are high utilization aircraft. So I can tell you the most expensive thing um, in our economic model is the maintenance. And so designing to achieve very low maintenance um, tends to push the design towards uh, simplicity and, and low articulation uh, complexity. But uh, from my mind, um, being a designer for 32 years, the answer's never at one extreme or the other, right? The answer's, uh, any optimum always ends up being somewhere in the middle. So I, I am convinced that what we need to do is, is actually design for low complexity but in very uh, elegant ways. And so one of the th ways that I think is a bit elegant is, again, many of these lift plus cruise concepts are having booms in different locations, especially trying to push the battery, which ends up being like 30, 35% of the gross weight, push that out and span load it a bit to, to, to make the wing design even lower and to get the batteries out of the cabin just in case they do start smoking and, and, and make it even less of a venting issue for, for the cabin. So since many of these concepts are, are, are using twin booms or you know pretty much all of them have a tail boom, we thought, wow, well, if they're using these lift propellers on booms uh, or on the tail, you know, wouldn't it be cool to maximize the control that we can get out of these vehicles? Because again, you got to take into account uh, the worst rotor or worst propeller failing um, at the worst possible time in transition and realize that these vehicles, again, are operating in a very complex environment that's very busy and transition control really becomes an incredibly important thing to maximize. And so this is just one of the degrees of freedom that we think could help maximize transition control by being able to essentially use uh, flow control by uh, um, having uh, tabs at the bottom of these nacelles that can uh, essentially redirect the flow to give direct side slip if, if these booms are up uh, by the CG or to, to provide uh, enhanced yaw if they're aft of the CG. So again, just one of the technologies where we'd like to stimulate the ecosystem so that all manufacturers can take advantage 
and have really fantastic transition control characteristics because we know how important it is. So I'll just end uh, saying it, it, it's not about one winner. It's not about one company. It's not about one concept. Um, we've already developed uh, several uh, common reference models. We expect to design, uh, develop many, many more as others want to contribute concept ideas, whether that's from universities or from NASA. Um, but I have reserved 007 for the coolest concept that someone comes up with. So, um, you know, if you want to get that, um, start showing your uh, reference concepts and, and hopefully we'll develop a whole family together that, that can help uh, expand the knowledge of this new wheel of, uh, of eVTOL opportunities. So with that, uh, I don't know if I have any time for questions, uh, five minutes for questions. I'd, I'd love to actually get into a dialogue instead of a presentation with you. Oh, not you. <laughs> Mike, awesome to see you. Hi. So, uh, how do we, how do you um, partake in the recognition stuff? I mean, how does a company partake in such a thing? Yeah, if you would like the common reference models, yeah. Yeah, so Mike says, how do I partake? Um, if you'd like the common reference models, then Ian. Uh, just uh, talk to Ian. He's our point of contact for d uh, distributing them. We're just about to get them onto our website in the next couple of weeks. We're developing a whole new Uber Air website, um, which will be unveiled soon. We're happy to share. These are open VSP models, so you actually can use NASA's Open VS tool, which is a parametric geometry uh, tool. Again, you're going to hear a lot more from Rob tomorrow about the tools that we'll be developing that will also be plugged into an open VSP framework. Um, so contact us and, and we'd love to start uh, working together. Um, uh, but to be clear, you know, while this is, these are open geometries, um, we are going to uh, reserve for our partners um, uh, different uh, data sets, uh, different um, things that we developed to provide them the maximum advantage but we will also at the same time make sure that we release enough data to stimulate and support um, the, the, solution, uh, the, the entire industry. Yes, sir. No, I, so I'll, I'll repeat it. So his question was, uh, is the requirements document, the vehicle requirements document going to be on the website? And the answer to that is no. Uh, and specifically because what we've done is extensive demand modeling uh, uh, within Uber over the past year to help formulate uh, the, the requirements. And so much of the, that, requ that requirements document has substantiation sharing all the data that we have. So I, 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 I think you know, that's a great point where we'd love to share aspects of it, like for instance, the design mission so that everyone can design, can understand the, 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 the basic mis mission specifications, but uh, we won't be able to share with the entire community the entire document. So what we'd love is if, if you have a specific part that, that you want shared, such as the reference mission, uh, contact us and we'd, we'd, we'd be happy to get out pieces of it that can support the community appropriately. Yes, sir. Sixty-five million is the uh, uh, the previously published uh, number of monthly users that we have on Uber. Actually, that number is higher, but we haven't shared a new public number. But I can tell you, it is insane working at Uber because every week you see the uh, the monthly progress reports of what's happening, and I've never seen a company grow so fast. Um, so we actually have uh, significantly more than 65 million, but I'm not authorized to be the one to distribute what that number is this week. I just have one follow-up question um, about the requirements document. You said you, sh you can share uh, snapshots of it. Um, um, I'm curious to know whether or not um, there is any um, information and requirements on, on standards in particular. 
Well, so I, I, relating to standards, that's a great question. And it's not just uh, vehicle certification standards, it's battery standards, it's uh, Part 135 operation standards, it's vertiport standards. Um, actually, we're keeping that out of, of that document so that we can be completely uh, open with what we're doing in the standards. And it's really not us that's doing the hardest part of the standards development. And I really want to do a shout out to Greg Where's Greg with Gamma? Way in the back. Gamma is doing a fantastic job on helping to push and work with the FAA on the vehicle certification standards and through ASTM. Anna Dietrich is in this room somewhere who is like doing awesome work. Uh, she's at Terra Fugia. She's doing awesome work with ASTM to push the vehicle standards forward. We're going to be very, very active um, in the battery standards. Many of you know like the O311A just got, had its final version. There's work to be done on the battery standards. We're excited that Selena has just joined us from Tesla as one of, one of the experts in the world on propagation resistance for lithium, lithium cells and the design of modules and, and packs to, uh, to be propagation resistant. Um, so there's much standards work to be done. We're going to do that completely openly and collaboratively, and every, the entire industry needs to become much, much more active, right, right, Anna, um, in, in pushing that forward. Uh, one of the things that we, we, where we have been a leader, where I'll, I'll take some credit on the standards, is we've initiated a vertiport standard that brings in all the electric veto requirements, and the uh, FAA Airports Division is actively working on that Vertiport standards uh, group with us and several other companies so that within the next uh, three years we will have the Vertiport standard locked up for these vehicles and approved by the FAA. Fingers crossed if we all do our work hard at it. Did that answer uh, your question sufficiently? Great, thank you.